If, if you've done any grading, you probably know this. I mean, the first thing you look for is whether the person got you know, the correct answer or not. And then you start looking through the steps of you know, wh whether they got there the right way. I mean, and ultimately, you only really want to give full credit to the person who you know, gives the correct justification in addition, but you get really pissed off if the person is also giving you the wrong answer. So, yeah, right answers are very important. Okay, um, office hours. So this is the exam. I've written it in large writing, so it should be very clear and you should not miss it. Also, remember that your name has a sort of multiplier effect, right? I mean, if, if you do not put your name on, you get zero on the exam. So you want to get that, that first part of the exam spot on. That's a very important part of the exam. Um, now, Peter Anderig has extremely generously uh, offered to run many, many office hours. And um, um, so, I mean, uh, Liz may also offer some in-person office hours. Um, uh, I'm also, along with Liz, available by email. Um, but as I said, Peter Anderig is offering a lot of office hours. So you might want to mark these down. I think he sent out an email, but just uh, make sure you have a note of this and you don't delete the email or anything. So um, coming up tomorrow, so Saturday, January 17th, 4 to 5.30 um, p.m. Um, and Wednesday and Thursday, uh, January 21st, 22nd, um, 4 to 6 p.m. And these are both in the uh, fourth floor uh, math department lounge. So lots and lots of office hours. You should, you know, if, if you're feeling at all weak on anything and uh, you uh, want some feedback about um, what exercises to try, you know, Peter Endrig might be a very good source because he can work through any problems with you, for instance. And that's actually a really good way of, of course, preparing for the final, just running through lots and lots of problems, um, trying lots of uh, things that you weren't comfortable with because then you'll get comfortable with them. So anyway, last time we, uh, we went through the subjects treated in the um, first two-thirds or so of the uh, study guide, which is online. So I mean, if, if you go online um, uh, you know, to the Math 122 webpage, there's a heading, um, final exam and review, or something like this. And that has um, useful links and resources and so on. So it has a link, for instance, to the study guide. I sent an email about that previously. Also, it, um, the links to the videos and notes from these review sessions are going up. Um, <laughs> Uh, the one from Wednesday, the, the notes and video from Wednesday are already up on the web page, so you can go get those in case you had to miss that for whatever reason. And um, so now I'm just going to continue um, slogging through the study guide. By the way, the study guide is in many ways more useful than what we did in the review session last time, because the review session last time wasn't necessarily entirely targeted to the exam, whereas the study guide, which I'm probably going to update um, shortly, is very much sort of targeted to the exam. So there you go. Okay, well, I'm going to get on with rings. Okay, great. So, I'm going to say a lot of redundant things. I mean, a lot of this is really straightforward, but I mean, this is a good time for you to actually just, you know, uh, uh, look at each of the words that I write and make sure that, you know, you, you, you feel you know, totally comfortable with the words, and if you don't feel comfortable with the words, you should definitely like, make a note of it and you know, go through and review those words carefully. So we're talking about rings, so I mean, you better know the definition of a ring, so you better remember that you have some sort of addition operation, this is an abelian group, that there's some sort of multiplication operation, and this thing is associative with one, you know, it has this uh, multiplicative identity thing, and in general, we assumed that this operation was commutative, um, although we looked initially at the non-commutative case as well. 
and there's some sort of distributed property that relates the addition and the multiplication. And we saw lots of um, convenient first examples that, that came almost immediately out of our study of group theory. So I mean, we have a sort of trivial ring, which is, I mean, in uh, some textbooks, that's not even considered a ring. I mean, sometimes it's uh, completely excluded from the discussion. Um, uh, other convenient examples, the integers. We'd already introduced the integers modulo n, and so uh, we saw also previously in, in the section on modular arithmetic that um, a z mod nz forms a ring. You should be very comfortable with arithmetic in z mod nz. You should be able to you know, quickly look at things, you know, mod small numbers, and be able to you know, find interesting examples of features um, of that ring. Um, and bear in mind things like when is that thing um, when does that thing have nice sort of field structure and why does it not have a uh, nice field structure in the composite case um, uh, of course any of the, the fields that, that, that were germane to the section on vector spaces were rings and um, given any ring you could construct a polynomial ring in fact, you could do things, funny things like construct you know, polynomial rings and infinitely many variables and stuff like that, although um, that isn't going to be a very important sort of example. Um, and sort of as the analog of um, the uh, normal subgroups from our discussion in group theory, we had ideals. These are the things that arise as kernels. But um, saying that the definition of an ideal is the kernel of a homomorph ring homomorphism is probably not the, the, the you know, ideal definition, um, pun intended. And you should really define it as being uh, a, an abelian, you know, that's something that, that, that's a uh, subgroup under the addition law and which is closed under, uh, under the uh, multiplication operation. So, uh, so subgroup under plus closed under multiplication by all of R, not just by I, the ideal itself. Um, and I mean, we saw lots of uh, good examples of ideals. We saw principal ideals. Or more generally, we saw ideals generated by a certain number of elements. So these are all linear combinations. Um, all linear combinations of those elements. And we saw a very, very important sort of operation. This, this operation turned up um, later in our sort of number theoretic study. This is a very, very important definition. Um, and that is that if I have two ideals, I can construct a new ideal, the, the, uh, the um, product ideal. And these were all sums. Um, AI, BI, where the AIs are in I and the BIs are in J. You need to be able to not just take, you know, um, single products, um, sort of monomial products of things in I and J, but the more extensive products of elements of I and J, because otherwise the thing would not necessarily be a uh, subgroup under the addition operation of the ring. Um, we saw homomorphisms. Ring homomorphism. So, um, and of course, these are things which uh, preserve the addition operation, the multiplication operation, and because of the way these things work, you need to additionally um, specify explicitly. I mean, you need to verify explicitly that uh, ring homomorphism preserves the uh, multiplicative identity. Um, otherwise, you don't necessarily have something that's a ring homomorphism. Um, of course, the kernel of ring homomorphism is an ideal, and the image, so it's an ideal of the domain ring, and the image is a subring of the target ring. And so those are sort of obvious things, but, um, there were some very good examples. I mean, there was a sort of canonical example, um, which we exploited. 
um, of a ring homomorphism. If I have any ring, um, then there's a natural homomorphism from the ring of integers to that ring. So this is for any ring R, and that's just you know, defined by sending the uh, multiplicative, identi uh, multiplicative identity of Z, namely 1, to the multiplicative identity of R, namely 1, and then just you know, using the obvious sort of uh, addition um, properties to uh, fill out that homomorphism. And it's, of course, easily verified that that is indeed a homomorphism. But the point of that was that we could exploit that to, to understand some very, very important structural aspects of, of rings. Um, uh, among them, um, we use that, for instance, to understand finite fields. We exploited this precisely to understand what, were the you know, what are the finite fields, like identify what are the possible finite fields. And then later on, we saw the background for why, that, um, why all of those were realizable. But we gave you know, what was um, you know, the largest possible set of finite fields using just the, an understanding of this homo homomorphism. So applied structure of finite fields. And um, another feature of uh, rings, um, so the, you know, the, the addition law obviously gives rise to a group, but there's another group that you canonically associate to a ring, and that is the uh, multiplicative group of that ring, um, or in the main terminology we used, the group of units. So denoted R cross or R star, these are the um, elements um, which are invertible. So there exists beta such that alpha beta is the multiplicative identity. And you know, in, in nice examples like fields, that, that was everything except zero, for instance. We saw um, building on. Uh, notions of ideals and homomorphisms, um, quotients. So you have a quotient R mod I, and of course, when you have such a thing, there's a, this canonical homomorphism from the ring to that quotient. And just as in group theory, um, the, the notion of quotients led to isomorphism theorems. So um, we had the first isomorphism theorem, which of course said, uh, you know, just like in, in the usual case, um, that if I have some sort of homomorphism phi, then um, R mod uh, cur phi um, admits an induced homomorphism from this phi um, to the target ring, and this thing is injective. And um, along those lines, we had uh, that um, you could understand the ideals of a quotient in terms of the ideals of the initial ring under sort of basic correspondence. Um, ideals of R mod J correspond to ideals of R um, containing J. So, and, and I mean, there was a third isomorphism theorem that said that in fact, not only do they correspond, but the, their correspondence is so natural that when you take quotients, the quotients are isomorphic to the quotients um, under this correspondence. Yes? Yeah, so I mean, that's the second isomorphism theorem. The second isomorphism theorem tells you what's the correspondence between uh, ideals in a quotient and ideals in the initial ring. Now, if you start out with a homomorphism, that induces, I mean, that, that thing corresponds to some sort of ideal of the ring, and you have, uh, you can you know, sort of rewrite this with J being the kernel, and then you will have, as you say, a statement like that. If you have a ring homomorphism phi from R to R prime, then the ideals um, of uh, the image of um, this homomorphism, since that's isomorphic to R mod the kernel, are going to correspond to the ideals of R containing the kernel, but that's just a, a accumulation of those two statements. It's not actually a generalization. Uh, uh, um, I think that, uh, that we, in the book, the first isomorphism theorem was, was listed as a special case. Okay. Uh, 
Uh huh. And, um, and I'm just wondering if we're ever responsible for that, too. Well, I think that all the things that are called isomorphism theorems follow pretty much immediately from those two statements. Well, I mean, and the sort of third statement I made, which is that, you know, the quotients are isomorphic under the second correspondence there. But I can't think of anything actually really more general than the, uh, for the first isomorphism theorem for the first state, than the first statement. I mean, it's, it's actually more general than the way it's usually stated in books. I mean, there you have to start with a surjective homomorphism. So, you know, it's, but I mean, these are all, you know, trivially equivalent. So it's not, it's probably not a big deal. I mean, you should be able to deduce from these statements whatever statement you need. I mean, in fact, the, the first, the, the isomorphism theorems are essentially tautologous anyway. I mean, you should, it, it should, you should now be at the point where you know exactly the proof of the, the, the you know, first isomorphism theorem in either the group or ring cases. It should be just completely immediate um, what's going on. I mean, math researchers at some point don't even call these things, you know, isomorphism theorems anymore. I mean, it's just sort of you just sort of write it down and it's just sort of automatic, you know why the thing works. Um, because, I mean, it's just the sort of general idea that if things are contained in the kernel, um, then since they're sent to something trivial and the target of the, uh, you know, whatever morphism you're dealing with, um, uh, you know, they, they, those differences don't matter. Anyway, the... Um, uh, one of the major uses of uh, this quotient construction was uh, the creation of relations. So, I mean, lots of very, very simple examples of creation of relations. So, suppose I start out with polynomials over the integers, and um, I now want to somehow you know, construct a new ring out of this thing such that, you know, x squared is minus 1, then I do the, the obvious thing. I want x squared plus 1 to be 0. So I quotient by x squared plus 1, and I indeed get now a ring which has this element, this formal element, which um, has as its square minus 1. And this is just the ring of Gaussian integers. So creation of relations is a very, very simple idea. And there's a bit of a warning on that. Um, be careful with um, what you think creation of relations actually does. So for instance, you might think that if you would uh, um, make x satisfy the property that its square is um, 1, um, then you would have just the integers back. In fact, if you mod out by x squared minus 1, you do not get the ring of integers. You get um, the integers cross the integers. And so understanding why this happens is, is a useful point. I mean, so I mean, you, you presumably remember how this works. I mean, if I have uh, an element alpha in the quotient here, and I'll just think of it as actually being a polynomial over the integers, so alpha of x, then um, I can, for instance, uh, get this thing by um, evaluating uh, at uh, plus 1 and minus 1. So alpha of 1, alpha of minus 1 um, induces an isomorphism. Okay. So then, sort of moving on from this creation of relations, I mean, you can assume that you're just starting out with some sort of polynomial ring over a ring, and um, use this construction to very precisely adjoin elements, much as we were doing here. Um, junction of elements. So, I mean, you know, at some point, you know, we, we wanted to do things just like there. So, you know, we start, you know, started with um, the integers. Um, and you know, we wanted to do something, say, like adjoin a square root of 2. So um, you know, we use the sort of notation z adjoin square root 2. And that was just z adjoin 
uh, the polling ring over x modulo x squared minus 2. But there was another sort of thing that we, we did, and that was we could do things like add inverses to elements. So, and, and this you know, turned out to be extremely important um, later when we were dealing with fields of fractions in a domain, uh, or of a domain, for a domain. Um, but you know, so suppose I want to join now to this ring an inverse of 3. So I want to join one-third. I mean, one-third is certainly not in the integers, but suppose you want to add one-third to the integer as well. Um, in fact, add it to this ring. So z join root 2 and a third. Well, I could write that as z join xy modulo x squared minus 2 and 3y minus 1. The image of y uh, under this homomorphism then gets sent to this thing, which behaves like a third. So adding inverses of things could be you know, done and is actually a very, very important sort of procedure. Um, we saw integral domains. And integral domains are, you know, in many ways, the most intuitive sort of rings because I think, I think in many ways the, the sort of prime ring that you always think of is the integers. Um, and uh, integers certainly are, you know, a former domain. And um, so th these are rings with no zero divisors. Um, which is to say that if AB equals zero, then A is zero or B equals zero. Of course, this is false in many rings. If I consider z mod 6z, neither 2 nor 3 are 0, but 2 times 3 is 0. Um, and that is the source of a lot of problems. I mean, so for instance, polynomials over such things behave rather differently than over a domain, uh, uh, than over a domain or over a field. So um, that's useful to bear in mind. Um, right. And given an integral domain, as I just uh, mentioned, there was this sort of canonical field that you could associate to that, the field of fractions. Now, given a domain R, you could associate to it its field of fractions, call it F. And um, the next topic we uh, dealt with was maximal ideals. Maximal ideals are very important. Um, because we use them extensively in all of our number theoretic work um, that came uh, with our study of factorization and so on. So, um, so M is maximal, of course, just by definition. Uh, if and only if... Um, the only ideals containing M, M are M and the entire ring. And this was equivalent to R mod M um, being a field. What? What? I thought we skipped the chapter, but that's And I assume we did it in class, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's pretty intuitive stuff. The thing about the, the, the section on, on uh, maximal ideals in the book is that it starts getting into algebraic geometry. So it has this whole thing on the Hilbert Nullstellen sets. Now, you don't need to know anything about the Hilbert Nullstellen sets. If you've been reading the study guide, you would know you do not need to know anything about the Nullstellen sets. We didn't do it in class, we didn't answer any problems on it or anything. Um, that's algebraic geometry. And we're not doing that. But I highly recommend taking algebraic geometry at some point in your life. Um, so the thing you mainly need to know about maximal ideals is that they're these you know, largest ideals. They are maximal. Oh, I should mention uh, one of the conditions that this is not, in fact, the unit ideal. Um, so, uh, and you know, it's, it's that second isomorphism theorem that I mentioned that tells you that uh, that's equivalent to the quotient being a field because, after all, 
a field is characterized by the fact that it has only two ideals, the zero ideal and the uh, full ideal, and those are distinct ideals. And that's just you know, saying that the only ideals you know, containing the thing are precisely those two distinct ideals. So there you go. Um, right. Oh, well, so let me just give some examples. So, um, this is a maximal ideal in the integers. Um, if C is any complex number, then this is a maximal ideal in polynomial ring. Those are pretty obvious because the quotient here is Z mod 3, which is one of the sort of archetypal fields we saw, and the quotient here is just C, and that's another pretty obvious field. Great. Mm. So then we started looking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So C is some fixed complex number. So I, I could write, you know, E, where E is the base of the natural logarithm or something. If that's no, I, okay. actually my question was going to be, um, I don't know if I'm having a brain fart or something, but what's the easiest way to see that that is a maximal ideal? I, I know it should be obvious in some way because it's yeah. reducible So consider. The uh, homomorphism, so I'll just return this to C. Consider the homomorphism from C join X to C, which takes a polynomial and evaluates it at C. The kernel, this is surjective, and the kernel is the principal ideal generated by X minus C. You can see that by various means, like the Euclidean algorithm on C join X. And um, so by the first isomorphism theorem, C mod C join X mod X minus C is isomorphic to C. C is a field. So by this characterization, X minus C is maximal. Sorry, you have a question. Yeah, why is it necessarily Oh, well, I mean, because I could just uh, take um, the you know, constant polynomial you know, R, so R plus no higher terms, and if I evaluate R at C, then I get R. So it's surjective. OK, great. So then we started looking at some more structured rings. We considered uh, um, you know, factorization um, as uh, a sort of innately important and interesting thing. And we found that factorization is, in general, a very, very difficult thing to understand. Um, but that under certain assumptions, if you start you know, uh, uh, finding um, additional properties of the ring, like there's some sort of division algorithm, then you can make the whole process a lot easier. You can actually start you know, disentangling how you know, given elements you know, uh, decompose into products of somehow simpler elements. So. Um, Again, sort of the, our archetypal example of uh, you know, almost anything is the ring of integers, and the ring of integers form a Euclidean domain, conveniently. Um, and so what's a Euclidean domain? Well, it's this thing. It's a ring. It has a Euclidean norm delta, which is this sort of, it's just some function on the non-zero elements of the ring, and it maps it to some uh, well-ordered set. I mean, that's really all you need—a well-ordered set. Although we, you know, I think we took as our, our you know, uh, target thing, you know, the, the uh, positive integers or the non-negative integers or something like that. But I mean, that, that's that's really not the essential feature. Um, I mean, the, the essential feature of, of the the, the, the non-negative integers is just that you know, I have some minimal element in any subset, a, a non-empty subset of those. Which is false in general. I mean, if I consider a non-empty subset of R, there isn't necessarily a smallest element contained in that set. I mean, I have infima, but I don't necessarily have a smallest element. But that's, this is true, though, for the non-negative integers, say. Anyway, so um, we have this Euclidean norm and uh, a division algorithm 
I mean, just some function would be stupid because I could always just define some function, but the point of the function is that it actually corresponds to something, it does something, and it's part of a division algorithm. The division algorithm saying that if I have A and a non-zero B, then um, there are Q and R such that A equals B Q plus R, and either R equals zero or the norm of R is less than the norm of B. E. And um, examples of such things, well, of course, Z, as I mentioned. Um, if I have a field, oh, and so what's the Euclidean norm here? Well, uh, just the absolute value. Um, if I have a field, then f of x is the Euclidean domain, of course, and it has as its Euclidean norm the degree function. And an important consequence of this observation that we have this division algorithm where the Euclidean norm is the degree was that, for instance, over a field, now this is of course false in general, but over a field at least, um, you have a bound on the number of roots of any polynomial. This is false in general, but for fields it's true that if I have a polynomial, over a field, so this implies a sort of corollary that f is a field and if f of x is a polynomial over that field, then the number of roots uh, of this thing f less than or equal to the degree which is a nice observation, but as I said, this is false if f is not a field. Hmm. Another nice example was the uh, Gaussian integers. So I joined uh, square root of minus 1 to the integers. This thing has, as its Euclidean norm, a plus, uh, evaluated in a plus bi, a squared plus b e squared, or put another way, just the square of the absolute value function where you view the elements here as complex numbers. And um, another important you know, caveat is that this doesn't generalize uh, to uh, arbitrary quadratic rings. So if I adjoin a square root of d to the integers, then it's not true that the corresponding um, thing that we later called a norm function is in fact a Euclidean norm. I mean, so if you just give me you know, a random thing like you know, z adjoined screw it, you know, 497 or something, that is not going to be a Euclidean domain, even though there is a sort of natural norm function on there. Well, I should say minus 497, because screw root 497, that's obviously not going to work, because you're going to have negative uh, images in the, uh, to the norm. You're, you're going to get arbitrarily you know, you know, uh, negative, you know, large negative numbers. Um, but anyway, so... Uh, it's not even true if I adjoin a square root of a negative number. Okay, in, in, in complete generality, although there are cases uh, where it does work. And then we saw a generalization of Euclidean domains. I mean, one of the, the, uh, the uh, principal things about Euclidean domains is that their ideals are principal. So we looked at that idea in greater generality. So we saw principal ideal domains, PIDs. Um, so these are things where, um, not too surprisingly, all ideals are principal. And um, of course, as I just said, if I have something that's Euclidean, a Euclidean domain, then that's a principal ideal domain. And how do we see that? Well, obviously the zero ideal is principal because it's generated by zero. But if I have some non-zero ideal, then um, choose uh, an element of the ideal with um, minimal uh, norm, minimal Euclidean norm, and um, then it's not hard to show that the ideal is, oh, and this should be non-zero, then i is in fact generated by this x, so there you go. 
Um, then there was all this stuff. Oh, sorry, was it a question? Okay. Class. There was a, a lecture where I tried to clear up a lot of that stuff. Now you don't have to know lots and stuff about lots of stuff about the relationship between prime and irreducible elements, but you should at least know the definitions and have some intuition for what's going on there. Know that, you know the very basics of the relationships between these things. So we had these things: prime uh, elements and irreducible elements. And these are distinct concepts, but in certain cases they actually can be conflated. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Another sort of uh, uh, generalization of PIDs we saw are UFDs. And um, these are unique factorization domains. So uh, domains where um, you can uh, factor elements uh, uniquely of course, up to associates, um, into irreducible elements. Um, and again, as I've said, this is a generalization. So if I have something that's a PID, it is a UFD. And UFDs have a lot of the things that you want most. I mean, they have sort of a notion of greatest common divisor, and they have, well, yeah, lots of good structure. Um, and uh, polynomial rings over UFDs, for instance, are very well behaved. If I have a polynomial ring over a UFD, then it's a UFD. Um, which was a useful fact in, in a lot of the stuff that we did. A lot of proofs are easier, actually, given the knowledge. Uh, a lot of proofs of things about like PIDs, like that uh, you know, the, the prime ideals are maximal ideals, become much simpler with you know, the, or, you know, the correspondence between irreducible and prime elements become much simpler in UFDs. So UFDs are very convenient uh, rings to work in. Right. Um, and we moved on to Gauss's lemma. So Gauss's lemma is treated in the book as if it's something about um, polynomials over the integers, of course it won't come as a huge shock that that generalizes significantly. But you don't really need to know it for anything then over the integers. So there was this notion of primitive polynomial over the integers. And this was one where if I write um, down the coefficients um, of this polynomial, you know, a0 through a1, uh, an, then um, the greatest common divisor of those coefficients is plus or minus um, 1. And from that, we had this notion of content. And we, we proved a lemma that said something like, um, given any polynomial over the rational numbers, there's a unique rational number, up to sign at least, although I think it's normalized in the book to be positive or something, but that's just silly, um, because it, that, that doesn't generalize. I mean, there's no notion of positive or negative in a general ring. So I mean, the, the good notion is just, you know, the thing is defined, content is defined up to units. I mean, that, that's what you see in any higher, you know, algebra textbook. Um, so the, the content is this thing that's uniquely defined up to units, which in integers are luckily just plus or minus 1, um, such that uh, I can write this polynomial as a product of the content and a primitive polynomial. This is a very, very important concept because um, it led to um, Gauss's lemma, or was uh, relevant as an application, uh, or combined with an application uh, of Gauss's lemma to a lot of um, studies of irreducibility of polynomials. So Gauss's lemma was this thing that said that if I have f and g being primitive, then the product of f and g is primitive. And of course, this was a relatively straightforward proof. The idea was that 
mean, it's, it's, you know, it, the principle of the thing can be you know, summarized in almost a sentence. The idea was that um, if uh, a prime p divides all of the coefficients uh, of fg, then because um, fp adjoin x, so the, the, the field with p elements adjoin x, is a domain, then um, that's saying this thing is 0, and hence that uh, either f is 0 or g is 0, and that's synonymous with p dividing all of the coefficients of f or dividing all of the coefficients of g, which would contradict a primitivity hypothesis. And so there is no such prime p, so the GCD must be plus or minus 1, so fg must be primitive. So it's a very, very simple proof, conceptually extremely simple proof, and um, it was nonetheless extremely important um, because it gave us results um, like um, if I have uh, an irreducible polynomial over z join x, then in fact that's irreducible. Um, over the rational numbers, which is not something that's a priori obvious. I mean, that's, that's actually a somewhat subtle statement um, a priori, although it comes out easily from an understanding of content in Gauss's lemma. Um, and um, yeah, so those are very, very important things. Very, very important things. And um, then, moving along, we saw that um, there were various criteria that took advantage of this sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, thing, this, this sort of basic irreducibility relationship to tell us, you know, more sophisticated irreducibility relationships. So, um, um, for instance, we had the Eisenstein criterion. which uh, said that if I have a polynomial over the integers, so call it, uh, call the coefficients a0 through a n, a n x to the n, this is over the integers, um, and a prime p such that uh, p does not divide the highest coefficient, but p does divide the lower coefficients, but also p squared does not divide a0, um, then this polynomial is irreducible um, as a uh, polynomial over the rationals. And I mean, after it seems like it's very, very difficult to, to I mean, find situations where your polynomial actually satisfies um, these divisibility hypotheses by some sort of prime. In fact, there, there are interesting cases which you saw on the homework where, or I mean, there, there were problems on the homework where there were multiple ways of showing that something was irreducible. But in many way, in, in many cases, one of the, the cleverest ways of showing that something was irreducible um, was to make a shift in the polynomial. So, for instance, it's pretty clear that f of x is irreducible if and only if um, f of x minus um, you know, S is irreducible. And it is in many cases true that um, even though f of x does not satisfy the Eisenstein criterion at any prime, the shift of the thing does, and so that gave you the irreducibility of this polynomial and hence of this polynomial. So that's just a, it's a clever little trick. It's something that, that's nice to know. Um, So this is the point at which we stopped doing, um, you know, a lot of stuff that, that, that could be, you know, very generalized, and we started looking at, you know, some, some very, very specific stuff, um, namely stuff about quadratic rings and especially um, imaginary quadratic rings, ones that um, are obtained by joining some square root of a, a negative integer. And um, 
because it's a Euclidean domain, a great place to start is the Gaussian integers. Um, and we started uh, trying to understand what are the primes of um, z join i, and how does that generalize? Well, it turned out to be fairly easy, actually, to uh, identify the primes of z join i. Now, I'm going to present um, you know, the, the, the theoretical statement, the structure theory for primes in a way slightly different from the book, but um, one that I think is sort of uh, conceptually more in line with um, uh, why this is useful and where this goes. So, I mean, the first thing I just want to remark is that this thing, you know, uh, this thing is a PID. So, um, prime ideals are the same things, or at least non-zero prime ideals. Which we're, I mean, we're not really interested in the zero ideal. We know that Z join I is a domain, and that's equivalent to the zero ideal being a prime ideal. Um, but, you know, forget about that. We know that already. It's not very important. So let me just exclude those. So the non-zero prime ideals are really the same things as prime elements. So if I have any prime ideal, it's generated by some element, and that element is uh, a prime element, necessarily, and vice versa. And so if I start out with some prime ideal, which you should now think of as just being a prime element, as I just said, um, remember that a prime ideal is one that satisfies if a product of elements is in the thing, then one of those elements is in the ideal. Um, then the intersection with the integers must be a prime ideal. It's not hard to show that. I mean, if I have a product of elements in here, then, well, in particular, it's in here, so one of the elements must be in there or in there, but I, you know, by hypothesis, this is a product of elements of z, so the thing must be a prime ideal. We know that the prime ideals of the integers are just the things generated by integer primes, so if I intersect with the integers, this thing is just some, uh, the, the principal ideal generated by some prime number. And, um, you know, so this is for some prime p and z. And what we saw was that um, we could recover all the possibilities for p from, uh, for big P from little p. So, specifically, um, if little p is 2, then there's only one possibility for the prime ideal. So there's only, I mean, the terminology used by number theorists is you talk about primes above another prime. So the primes above two, the ones that, that somehow um, intersect the integers to give you two, um, well, there's only one of those, and that's the, the principal ideal of z adjoint i generated by one plus i. Up to, you know, I mean, this thing is, of course, I mean, ideals, uh, ideal generators only to determine up to units, so I mean, there, there are a lot of other possible generators, but that's the basic idea. W yes? Like the primes above 2 there, don't you, I mean, what you're saying are things that divide 2 in the ring of Gaussian integers? Yeah, that's, that's uh, another way of stating it. So um, it turns out that, that um, and I think this is explained in the book to some extent at least, that the, uh, um, the order relation, so I mean, an ideal being a subset, you know, principal ideal being a subset of another principal ideal is the same thing as a divisibility relationship. And so, I mean, for, for fairly obvious reasons. So, um, yes, I mean, using that, that, that correspondence between divisibility and, um, you know, the, the fact that, well, by definition, I mean, by construction, this thing, um, uh, this is contained in this, that tells you that this must divide this. Is that clear? Great. Okay. So if I have a prime congruent to 3 mod 4, then the prime above p is, well, just p. So it's not, it's not, not the, the most interesting case. And in the case where p is congruent to 1 mod 4, then p is generated by some prime element pi of z join i, 
such that pi pi bar um, uh, is equal to p. Um, and um, so th this is actually you know, a highly sort of exploitable consequence. And I think at some point the, the, the book you know, uh, goes into you know, a sort of nomenclature for these three different cases. So this case, I think, is at some point called the ramified case because you know, it, this is not the same thing as this prime, but it's, you know, uh, it's you know, the case that, not, not the case that there's some sort of distinct conjugate um, which um, you know, ha has as a, its product with this thing being the prime. Uh, I mean, the square, in other words, of p, p squared, is um, the principal ideal generated by little p, well, 2 in this case. This is the inert case. I mean, inert, you know, p doesn't do anything. It's inert. Um, and this is the split case, because in this case, um, pi, pi bar, so then these are distinct ideals in this case, completely distinct ideals, actually equals this thing. So that prime here, split, or the thing that was a prime here, when I extend it to z adjoin i, splits into a product of uh, two ideals. Yes? Uh, sorry, when you say p squared is equal to the prime ideal 2, yeah. um, wouldn't it be uh, i plus 1 times i minus 1 times its complex conjugate? Is what I mean, if, if I take 1 plus i squared, I get like minus 2i or something like that. Uh, yeah, I mean minus 2i or uh, 2i. And the point is that i is a unit in z adjoint i, so the principal ideal generated by 2i is the same as the principal ideal generated by 2. Um, great. And we saw a generalization of that, uh, of this kind of, this kind of uh, framework, this kind of you know, set of possibilities for how primes behave um, uh, later on. Um, in a uh, much greater generality. But let me just say something else first. Um, something about what the generalization of z adjoin i is, because that is sort of a prerequisite for talking about um, how primes behave in the generalization. So, so suppose I start out with some sort of quadratic ring. So I, I've joined some sort of square root of an integer to um, the rational numbers, well, we saw that there's a notion of algebraic integer. So um, we have the ring of all algebraic integers in there. And Books calls that thing R. Another notation you might see elsewhere is O sub F. And we found that. Um, what this thing is depends on what this generator is. So I'm going to just assume that D is square free. And um, in some cases, this was just sort of the, the most obvious thing. D congruent to 2 or 3 mod 4 meant that all the algebraic integers just looked like sums of uh, integers plus integers times square root D. But in the other case where d is congruent to 1 mod 4. Obviously, the case congruent to 0 mod 4 is impossible, because then a square, namely 4, would divide the thing. And we're assuming d is square free. So z join 1 plus root d over 2 um, is the ring of all algebraic integers. So or put it another way, um, sums of either integers um, plus integers times square root d, or half integers, explicitly, you know, truly half integers plus truly half integers times square root d. So um, that was good. And one of the things to, to explore when you're trying to understand things like primes and factorization are units. I mean, they turn up in the def very definitions of, you know, uh, things like irreducible elements. So um, it's good to have a pretty good idea of what the units are. And in complete generality, whether or not d is positive or negative, although I think in the book it's stated only for d negative, in complete generality, um, the units in uh, the, the, the ring are the elements 
whose norm r plus or minus 1. Now, of course, if r is imaginary quadratic, norms must be positive. So I could have equally well said if d were negative that this is the set of things with norm alpha equal to plus 1. But um, if I want to include the real quadratic ones, the ones that I get by joining some positive uh, integer, a uh, square root of a positive integer, then I need to include negative 1. There. So, and the proof of that was pretty obvious. Um, and of course, by the norm of alpha, um, or better put, uh, the norm of a plus uh, b root d, so these are either integers or half integers according to the case of d. There's a question? Well, I mean, in the case where I have uh, d being positive, the norms could be negative, right? I mean, I could have something with norm negative 1. But by the same proof, that's obviously still a unit, right? Sure. So it better be in there. Yeah. I mean, so, so for instance, um, you know, uh, uh, let me think of, see if I can think of a, uh, an appropriate unit. I mean, if I look at 1 plus... Uh, square root 2 or something, um, the, the uh, norm of this is negative 1, right? Because it's 1 minus 2. That's negative 1. But it's a unit because I could multiply by this by negative 1 minus root 2, and that's equal to 1. So this is clearly a unit, but its norm is negative. Is that clear? Great. So this is a plus b root d times a b. Uh, a minus b root d, or put another way, a squared minus b squared d. So of course, if d is negative, then this number is always positive. But if d is positive, then this could be very, very negative, or it could be minus 1, it could be anything. Um, well, not anything. That's a, not anything. Well, anyway, there you go. OK, and then in, in the explicit case, uh, where d is negative, you could say more. I mean, in, in the case where d is positive, there are tons of units that are just like flowing out of your ears. Um, but um, uh, in the case where d is negative, the, you know, the, the, it really becomes a much simpler sort of situation. So you can give a complete sort of list of all the possibilities. Um, if d is minus 1, then these are the units. In other words, in the Gaussian integers, and we already knew that. In, um, uh, the case of d being minus 3, uh, letting zeta 6 denote a sixth root of unity, all the powers of a sixth root of unity uh, form uh, the, the units uh, in that case. And then um, if d is uh, anything else negative, um, then it's just plus or minus 1. It's pretty easy to prove that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so the next thing, I, I just want to make one last comment. And that is, um, in studying the, the prime ideals of more general R. The crucial thing to sort of bear in mind is that you have this sort of relationship. Um, you know, say, say R mod P is the same thing as Z adjoint X modulo, well, either X squared minus D or X squared minus X plus 1 minus D over 2, depending on what case you're in, whether this is you know, the, the D congruent to 2 or 3 case or congruent to, uh, uh, or in the uh, d congruent to 1 case. And this thing is then just fp join x modulo, well, again, either x squared minus d or this other polynomial. And so that tells you a lot. So for instance, you know, th this allows you to say things like, well, um, you know, uh, I can say that something is maximal, uh, you know, a prime, you know, an integer prime is maximal in this quadratic ring. Um, by looking all the way over here and seeing that the polynomial 
over here is irreducible and hence you know, uh, generates some maximal ideal and hence this thing is a field. And so then lifting back here, you knew that that thing was maximal. So I'll answer more questions after I disconnect myself, but um, I need to let him go. So great.